In this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at what are called chords and arcs. So, first we need some definitions and theorems. There's going to be a lot of theorems in this lesson, and each of them does come with a converse. Again, we'll focus on the main theorem, understand that the converse exists as well. So, first, what is a chord? A chord, by definition, a segment whose endpoints are on a circle. So, the circle that is shown here, if I draw a line segment across it, that becomes a chord. Now, we do know of one special kind of chord, a chord that travels through the center of a circle is a diameter, but as long as it is a line segment, goes from one side to the other, then it is a chord. Now, what is an arc? A portion of circle circumference is an arc. Now, on this circle that we have shown, we actually have two arcs. We have a minor arc, which is the smaller portion, and there is a major arc, which the difference between a minor arc and a major arc is a minor arc is less than a semicircle. A major arc is over that semicircle portion. So it's beyond uh, connecting a diameter. So what we're going to be looking at is these segments that are created and the arcs that are related to them through this lesson. So first, theorem 12.4. This one states... Within a circle, or in congruent circles, congruent central angles have congruent arcs. Now when we talk about central angles, what that means is if we were to draw radii from the center of our circle out to the endpoints of the arc, that inner portion here is the central angle. So if I have two of these in the same circle, or two of them in congruent circles, then the arcs that they trace out, that minor arc, will be congruent as well. Now again, this one does have a converse, so if the, ang the arcs are congruent, then that means that the central angles forming them would be congruent as well. Theorem 12.5. Within a circle or congruent circles, congruent central angles have congruent chords. So similar to the idea of the, having those congruent arcs being formed, the chords will be of the same length also if our circles are congruent. The converse to this, within circle or congruent circles, congruent chords have congruent central angles. Last, at this point, let's look at theorem 12.6. Within a circle or congruent circles, congruent chords have congruent arcs. So in the diagram that I already have drawn, you see one chord along with its arc. If I were to come in and put in a second chord, say here, that is of the same length as the original, then the arc that is formed for it will be congruent. Converse, if you have congruent arcs, then they're formed by congruent chords. This will leave us just one more theorem before we start looking at some problems associated with them. Theorem 12.7 tells us, Within a circle or congruent circles, chords equidistant from the center have, or centers are congruent. Then the converse, within a circle or in congruent circles, congruent chords are equidistant from the center or centers, depending on if we're talking one circle or multiple. So let's use, begin using these theorems to look at our pieces here. In the diagram shown, we have a circle with two chords drawn, and partial radii put to them. So we can see that here we have a length of 16, and then it bisects this chord into two segments of 18. Then on the right, again, we have a uh, congruent or perpendicular section and a chord with a total length of 36. Well, because 18 plus 18 is 36, these chords are congruent to one another. According to theorem 12.7, if they're congruent, then they must be equidistant from the center. If we put these pieces together, then it's going to tell us that x is also equal to 16 because of that relationship that exists. And now applying the ideas from previous theorems on the last slide, we would know also that the arc minor arc formed here with these two segments of 18 is congruent to the minor arc formed by this 36. 
also that the angles that come out from the center with radii to the endpoints of the arc, those angles in the middle are congruent as well. So we can start to put a lot of these ideas together in the one basic shape. Now, we still have a few more theorems to go over in this lesson. Let's begin with theorem 12.8. Theorem 12.8 tells us in a circle, if a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects that chord. So we can start to find some new relationships here, similar to the ones we found when we were working with triangles. But let's continue on. Theorem 12.9 states in a circle, if a diameter bisects a chord, that itself is not a diameter, then it is perpendicular to that chord. So this is basically the converse of theorem 12.8. And our last theorem for this lesson is going to be theorem 1210, which tells us in a circle, the perpendicular bisector of a chord contains the center of the circle. Now what this theorem does allows us to take theorems 12.8 and 12.9 and apply them to radii, not necessarily always working through the existence of a diameter. So what can we do with all these theorems now? Um, we're going to be developing them in future lessons, but let's take a brief look at a little application here. So we're going to find measures of, for the missing variables based on all these theorems of chords. So in our first diagram, we have chord LM and a partial line segment here, KN with a radius r going along the length of kl. And we need to find that length of r. Well, based on the fact that this forms a right triangle, and we have or have way of knowing two of those sections, we can find the third. So let's begin. We have 3 as one of the legs, and 7, half the distance of this 14, as the other one. And what we need to do is find r. Well, because this is right triangle, the 3 and 7 are the legs, and r is our hypotenuse. We can use a Pythagorean theorem. 3 squared is 9, 7 squared is 49, and that's going to equal r squared. So 9 plus 49 is 58. That's equal to r squared. And going through and simplifying this using decimal approximation, the radius of this circle is going to be approximately equal to 7.6 centimeters. Now let's try it on this next diagram. We know the radius is 15, and we have a chord, AF, with midpoint of C, where AC and CF are both equal to 11. And what we want to know is how far is point C from the center of the circle at point B. Well, what we can do is use a little bit of the symmetry that exists here. Because we have 15 for this radius, EB, all radii will be the same length, so that 15 is AB. Because C is this midpoint, we know that this forms a perpendicular bisector with B, uh, with line segment BC. So now applying Pythagorean theorem again, we have 11 squared plus Y squared being equal to 15 squared. 11 squared is 121 plus our Y squared will equal 225. Going through and subtracting, we'll have Y squared is equal to 104 and taking the square root of both sides here y is approximately equal to 10 and 2 tenths. So we can start to find a lot of relationships that exist inside of circles based simply off the chords and the arcs. Um, a bit of notation that was not mentioned earlier in this lesson Chord is just going to be written as if it were a line segment because ultimately that is what exists for a chord. But when we start talking about the arcs, if I were to talk about chord AF in the second set here, I would just talk about line segment AF. The only difference is that the line segment has its endpoints on the circle. 
But if I want to talk about arc AF, I will put my A and F, and then over top I draw a part of a circle, an arc, so that I can distinguish what it is. And reminder, this circle, circles are named by their centers, so this is circle B, and the way we denote that is place the center with the circle around it next to the name of the circle, so this would be circle B. So a little bit of notation, a lot of theorems and definitions in this lesson. Make sure you have them down. This is a lot of front-loading of information that we're going to be using as we move through our study of circles.